Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober Podcast and I want to advise you to please mark your calendars for January 25th. January 25th, we will be celebrating our 100th episode live and in person at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes with some special guests that are not yet announced. So please mark your calendars, January 25th. This is the first time I announce it, so yeah, look out for that. Let's give a big shout out to Espacio 1839 for allowing us to do the podcast inside here in their little shop. It's the holidays, so please come in here and shop some stuff for your family and friends. They have anything that you need. Espacio1839.com or in person at 1839 East 1st Street in Boyle Heights. Don't forget to like and to subscribe and keep up with us. You can also um, now... Become a member by hitting the join button for only $4.99 a month. You can help support this podcast or a little more. If you have a little more, click the join button for more information. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Dancing Sober podcast. This is the post Christmas pre New Year show. Today in the studio, we have Rey Sepulveda from Cultivarte Studios in Sela. In the Southeast LA. Yeah. What's up with that? Tell us a little bit about Cultivarte Studios. Uh, wow. Cultivarte Studios uh, started, I would say, in about 2012. 2012, so about 10, 11 years ago, here in the city of uh, Borderline, Boyle Heights, East LA. Mm. Uh, I was working out at a company in the city of Vernon, and I was uh, working at the sample department making picture frames. Okay. Um, and then uh, after working there two years, two years and a half, I realized that was like a dead end job. Mm. So I kind of uh, found this space out in in Boyle Heights that uh, we took over a small little garage, and I started buying and selling frames nice. from the same place that I was working at. So that was the beginning. Oh, crazy. That's what, that's where I first met you too, doing frames. Doing so picture frames, yeah. Let's go back a little bit. Um, in, this, in this podcast, we like to start at the origin story. So tell, tell me a little bit about where you were born and where you grew up and who was little Ray? Yeah. Man, well, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Durango, Mexico. Mm. Uh, 19, 1984. Oh, okay. So... For those folks counting out there, 39. <laughs> <laughs> 39, bro, if you're trying to do the math. You know? The year of the Olympics. I'll help you out a little bit. Uh, and so in 1991, uh, my dad used to work out here in the U.S., mm. uh, temporary work. Like he'd be out here during the summer, a couple of months, mm. making some U.S. dollars, and then he'd go back home to Mexico Um you know, to bring back the money or whatever to 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 sustain the family. But um, back then, uh, my mom had a lot of issues with my father, my bi biological father. So uh, we ended up fleeing from him wow. because he he was a, a he used to beat us up. You know, mm -hmm. he, was, he was a violent person and hands on and stuff like that. You know, so one day my mom came up to me. I was already seven years old. And, you know, seven years old in Mexico, it's like... That's big, yeah. But you're already grown up, you know? So she came to me and she's like, mijo, you know what? Your dad's coming back tomorrow from working in the U.S. Like, I don't want to be here when he mm. comes, you know? She's like, so I'm thinking of leaving, you know? Mm. What do you think? And I was like... Let's go. Let's go, <laughs> you know? Like, I knew, I knew what my mom was already kind of referring to. Like... He's gonna come back and fucking beat us up and beat our beat our asses and yeah. whatnot, you know. So uh, we made that decision there to to go to Mazatlan because that's where my grandpa was living. So we went there to say goodbye, and then we were there three days, four days. Uh, while I was there, I I I cut myself with one of his razor blades. You know, in Mexico they use the, the shavers. <laughs> so I was being a little mocoso. I got up to the window and he had a shaver up there. The shaver came down and opened oh. up and cut me. So I had to go to the ER and get sewed up. Uh, three days later, then didn't stop nobody. You know, three days later we were in TJ. Wow. And we were in Tijuana getting ready to cross the border. Yeah. So we were in Tijuana, I think like two days with the coyotes waiting, wow. waiting for our turn, you know, for our group. Yeah. To, to to be our turn to cross over. So it took about two days. Yeah. And then one day they came in the afternoon and said, okay, alistense. 
Do you remember all of this? Yeah. Wow. Because tonight we're we're leaving, you know. Yeah. So, um, back then I guess it was a little bit less less dangerous now because than now because now you hear all the stories of folks like dying in the desert and you know brutal brutal yeah. stories. Out I mean, of the maybe sun it was the same, but we didn't hear all the stories, you know. That's true. Maybe Couldn't you know be, I was too young, so I think it's always we, been dangerous. We ended up crossing from Tijuana to San Diego, man. We ran. Maybe like two hours out in the mountains, mm. running through across the fence. I knew I knew we were doing something that wasn't yeah. permitted because as a young kid, you can see the adults, and then we were hiding. You know, we'd hit yeah. a, hit a certain place, and then we'd hide for a bit, and then we wow. keep going and hide for a bit. And that's uh, nowadays I laugh at that experience because when you when you're going through the freeways and you see the signs of folks yeah. crossing, yeah, so like, like that was us, you know? like <laughs> exactly. real. Like yeah. now thinking about it, we must've came through the mountain on the north side and okay. had to cross the freeway mm. because there was a car there on the other side waiting for us. So we crossed the freeway, jumped in this car and we were on the freeway all the way to LA. So, you wow, know, we, we made it on our first try. Yeah. So that was, that was a good thing. And this was in the night. So we crossed in the night. So. Wow. Seven years old, dude, that's small, but also like old enough to have those vivid memories. And then it was just you and your mom or? And my younger brother. Younger brother, okay. So at that time I was seven and he was four. Damn. Uh, we crossed on his birthday. So I always remember the day, <laughs> night, birthday, uh, October. <laughs> uh, no, my bad. Uh, August 12th, 1991. Mm. That's his birthday. ¿Y dónde llegaron? Um, at that time, we already had my sister's, my mom's sister okay. was already here in, in Los Angeles. Okay. So she's the one that brought us over, you know, she yeah. sent money, whatnot, and then arranged it, arranged yeah. it. And then we came over and, and stayed with her for a few years. Wow, dude. Yeah. That's crazy. She was already working in the, uh, as a costurera, planchando. Mm. So when my mom came over, that was her first trabajar, job. Trabajar, yeah. Trabajar, you know, yeah. to, to pay back the loan. Huh. <laughs> When I was young, we lived, uh, 10 of us, in a small fucking house. And my grandma used to do costura. So we always had that giant, big green machine. Yeah, you know, yeah. The industrial machine yeah. was always in the living room. And there was always stacks and stacks. Stack. She'd go work in the daytime, come home, and still at night do stuff at do home. The stuff to try to keep side. the numbers up, you know, because yeah. it was all about numbers. They got pennies per. Back in the days, my mom was getting yeah. paid per, by the piece. Yeah, by the it piece. It wasn't by the hour. It was no, like it was pennies diez, by the centavos piece. por exactly. cada... Vestido planchado, bro. Yeah. Like, so they ridiculous, would, you know? Yeah, they would, they would, you know, the more pennies they could pile, the better. That's crazy. So I, I'm familiar with, like, having all that costura stuff around the house. Yeah. And so I, you started to grow up right there with your family. You had cousins and stuff. You, you know, you had, did you have a good environment right there? Uh, we had a, a few cousins out here. Um. Good environment, I wouldn't say so. Uh, when we came here, or my first uh, city that we lived in was Huntington Park, yeah. which is predominantly <laughs> low-income immigrant families yeah, yeah, yeah. back in, in the 90s, you know, uh, a few blocks away from, from Pacific Boulevard, the yeah. famous Pacific Boulevard. So I grew up there. Um, the cousins that I had were into the wrong things. Yeah. So my mom never really actually liked me hanging out mm. with, with that set of cousins. And that was really all the family we had out here. Wow. My tia, us, and that was it. You yeah. know, everybody else was in Mexico. Wow. So you, they put you in elementary school. You started. Yeah, I started in second good grade. Grades, second being, grade. Um, being a leader. <laughs> <laughs> second grade wa wa was, was cool because I grew up... Uh, when I came uh, at, at that level, grade level, we still had bilingual teachers. Mm. So I came here Spanish speaking, first language, no English. Um, my first teacher in second grade, she used to make us quesadillas on Fridays, like little, little cool little yeah, things, you know? Yeah. So I had a good experience in second grade. Um, third grade was kind of similar. Uh, I, I was at Middleton Elementary in HP. And then in my fourth grade, we moved across town to another apartment, uh, and that's when I moved over to Miles, mm. Miles Avenue Elementary, and that was, I would say, the toughest for me because when I went to Miles, 
My house is on the nicer side of town mm-hmm. of Huntington Park. Mm-hmm. Right? You got Middleton on like what we would call like the, the mostly apartments. And then my house is over here on the other side where it's mostly houses, you know, single family homes, maybe second generation, third generation folks. So mm-hmm. when I went to my house there, they didn't offer any more bilingual classes at fourth mm-hmm. grade. Yeah. So I remember vividly just crying every day in the morning wow. because I don't want to go to school because I didn't understand. Wow. It was just something that was so shocking to me, you know? Yeah. And I used to cry every morning, every morning. Yeah. Um, just because of the environment, not really because of the kids. Um, yeah, you just felt like a complete stranger or outsider yeah. or... Yeah, we, we had a TA in the classroom and there was, I remember, three of us students who were Spanish-speaking only. So she would kind of help us do our work and translate and and but still keep you us were the separate track. you were like but we were separate yeah. yeah my only my only good days I remember going was Fridays wow because we used to have like a uh, games on Fridays so mm. after I think after nutrition we'd come back to the classroom and the teacher had all kinds of board games yeah. and uh, just just fun stuff you know that you didn't really need language to to yeah, yeah. to get along with the other kids so um, that was my first semester it was just That's crazy you remember these, these details. <laughs> Because it was so horrible, long. bro. <laughs> I remember crying, you know? Um, second semester of fourth grade, uh, you know, as kids, you're fast to pick up. So I, I, I picked up the language, even though it was the scariest year or mm. semester in, in, in you my, had to my learn young it, life. So, yeah. I feel like it was the most blessing because I got to actually learn the language. And by the time I came back for my second semester of fourth grade, mm. I was already speaking English, bro. Wow. Like, you know, I came back speaking English yeah. in, in the regular class. The America. All, all my classmates. Uh, uh, my name's Ray Eduardo, so these people started calling me Eddie, you mm. know? Eddie, Eddie, Eddie this, Eddie that. And and I, I was super grateful because I grew up a lot of with a lot of them through middle school and high school. Mm. And I, I never remember getting bullied. Oh, that's cool. You know, we hear a lot yeah. of stories about folks getting bullied, and that never, ever happened to me. So, you know, I always had... Uh, Good memories of those folks that I grew up with in the classroom around that mm. time. Did you go to um, HP High School? Yeah, I went to uh, Gage Middle School and uh, HP High School. Mm. Um, most of the, my time moving around was when I was a youngster. So after that f- second semester of fourth grade and the second semester of fourth grade, we ended up moving to uh, Normandy. I ended up attending Normandy Elementary mm. in like the, the South Central area. Mm. Predominantly uh, black folks around that time in the 90s. I would say like 90% black, 95% black students and maybe 2%, 3% Mexican mm. and, and the rest other, you know, uh, Guatemalan folks, Salvadorian folks. Mm. Uh, and then I was there about a couple of months and then we ended up moving again because, you know, that uh, unstable mm-hmm. childhood, my mom, different jobs. Did your dad ever come back? Uh, we left my dad and, and he came to chase us maybe like a year later. Wow. And he tried to find work out here. He ended up staying with my aunt and my mom for mm-hmm. maybe a month. Mm-hmm. But after a month, uh, my mom was like, no, no, <laughs> this ain't going to work out, mm-hmm. you know? And so I remember that was another traumatic day in my life because I know... My mom said we were going to go visit one of my aunts, mm. but somehow I knew saying bye to my dad that that was like the last time we were going to see him, you know? Mm. Wow. It was like a despedida without really her putting it out there, you know, to yeah. say like, yo, he's going back to Mexico. We're going to leave for the day. And when you, we come back, like he's gone. Yeah. Um, but I already knew, you know, somehow as a kid, like you sense those things. So I remember crying too after after he left, even though... As a kid, it was just conflicting emotions, you know, because yeah. it's like, well, we ran away from him. Yeah. He's here now, but it was like, for man, a reason. he's still my father or whatnot. Like, I still had some sort of feelings as a kid. Of course, yeah. Um, but I always had that resentment towards him, you know, that he he didn't really put in the work or, or did what he was supposed to do or behave yeah. the right way. So that's why... Uh, my mom didn't stay with him, you know, so... Oh, okay. Throughout the years, uh, he my mom was like, yo, here's your dad's number. Oh, crazy. Like whenever you want to call him, like, you're free to call him. Yeah. But it never came out of me, bro, to, like, yeah, yeah. pick up the phone and, and call him, you know? Yeah, yeah, So that was the last time I ever saw him. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. And that was in... Maybe, like, 93. Yeah. 93. Yeah. 
Well, sometimes, you know, those things happen and sometimes people lose parents for different reasons and sometimes, you know, so it's, it is what it is and you just move forward, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Y como te fue en high school then? Did, around this time, like, did you, were you already like into art or were you doing stuff like that at all? Uh, you know, I, I, I would say I was starting to hang out with the wrong crowds. Mm. Starting in middle school, you know, mm. I used to hang out with the little cholitos after school, yeah, play taggers. ball, taggers, mm -hmm. you know. So once I got to high school, that was kind of one of my interests, tagging, you know. <laughs> so uh, I remember having art class in ninth, ninth grade. And our teacher was an older teacher, kind of past her prime. So there was really no connection there with the students. You know, she was there doing her job. And everybody used to take advantage of her. All the students knew to like, <laughs> you know, she was she was the one to like get away with things. So... Um, I ended up uh, stealing her her acrylics, her tube, you know, acrylics in the tube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And because I was into art or or writing or whatnot, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's I think that's when my my story of being involved in art and in the community started. Wow. Because at that point, uh, I used to love playing soccer. Yeah. Growing up with the watching the mundiales and and all you know worldwide sports. So we came over here and. We used to play a lot of soccer in the alleys with the kids. And finally, after a few years, my mom budged and she let me play in a little soccer team, like nice. a league, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, one day uh, we went to practice, which we were practicing at Bell High. So we'd walk around, we'd walk from Huntington Park, where we lived, all the way to Bell High School to go practice. Wow. Uh, My coach, that's a good fucking walk. That's a good walk. Yeah, as a, as a as a young kid, that's a nice little yeah. walk. And uh, that that one day, particular day where this story is going, my soccer coach didn't come, hmm. so we had to walk back because he was usually was was a right was a right home, you know. So he didn't show up. I think as kids, we still ended up like kicking the ball around, practicing whatever, you know. Yeah. And then on our way home, well, I had the acrylics in my backpack. Mm -hmm. That I stole from the art teacher, you know. Mm -hmm. So we were walking down down uh, Bell Avenue, the little street, and over there, they have curfew. Bell's Bell has curfew for if you're under 18, you can't be out past nine. And you were out by yourself. Me and and oh, two, my two other little buddies who we used to live in the same little apartments, playing the same team. So we went home tagging, mm. tagging, uh, writing, trying to figure out our names. You know, I think I, I think I was writing flame. Flame one back in those days, <laughs> before funny. fire emojis were even a thing, you know. <laughs> so on our way home, we got sure enough, we got pulled over by the cops, man. Wow. And, and in Bell, in those years, the, there was a lot of racist cops. Yeah. Uh, same in HP. So we got pulled over. They saw what we were doing. They they checked our hands. You know, I almost was able to wipe my hands clean, but they caught us with paint. You know, yeah. with, with proof. Con la masa en las manos, kind of how they say, you know. So um, they were like, at first they were like, okay, we're going to go to the neighbors, get a water and a broom, and you guys are going to clean this up. Mm. But then when they flashed the light and they realized, like, how much we had been riding, oh. they were like, oh, no, we can't clean this up. Fuck. Like, you guys are going in, you know. So they, well, they How much had you done? Like, you did, like, a whole bunch of houses like, or? Like, blocks, bro, like two, three blocks of right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the sidewalks, on the on the, yeah, on the concrete, like everywhere, you know, we were just having a blast. Wow! And um, so they said it was too much. They didn't let us clean it up, and so we ended up getting booked at 14 years old. You know, I was wow. 14 years old, immigrant. Yeah. So that was a scary situation. Hell yeah! Uh, they took us to the station, and we were there like four hours. Mm. They never called our parents. What? So it was kind of like a tactic. To, to, yeah, to, you know, scare, you, just yeah. to scare us, yeah. to scare my parents, most likely, too, because, you know, my, it was late. So it, it, it was like we were supposed to be home at nine, but came 10, nothing, wow. 11, nothing. My mom was trying to find us, couldn't find us till she finally said, like, you know what, let me call the cops. Yeah. So she called HPPD down the street and they, they told her, like, well, actually, yeah, we know where he's at. You know, he's at the <laughs> Bell PD. And so she came by to, to pick me up. And that was kind of, that was a, a weird situation because my mom was the one to be strict with the chancla. Mm -hmm. And that day she came and picked me up and, and 
took us home and had me in the car and she's like, wow, like, I'm yeah. so disappointed. Yeah, that was a big like, one. Like, damn. Like, I don't even know what to say. And yeah. she didn't even beat me, bro. Yeah, because it's that's already what, a lot. That's what hurt me the most, yeah. like, that I didn't get a beating, you know? It was just more like that disappointment was just like yeah. It was already heavy me. enough for her. Yeah. And she didn't want to, like, yeah. you know, push it. It's crazy, dude. That's yeah. I mean, people do that like all the time, every day, everywhere. But it's crazy how it affects people differently. So like, yeah, your mom, she told you enough without doing nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, man, I messed up real bad. Yeah. You know, immigrant kid at the police station, like, yeah. having to go to court and navigate yeah. the court system. Making your mom come is a big thing too. Like having her like have to face police and have talk to, to police. It's undocumented it's herself, tough, bro. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I could see how that was bad and. Having to navigate through a court date and courts, juvenile yeah. court system and all of that for her too was just horrible, you know? So yeah. That, that was kind of my where my art career started. Yeah, but I, <laughs> like, so you got in trouble, you got out of it, and, and they, didn't, they didn't give you, like, fines? Did they give you... Yeah, I had to do, like, I think it was, like, 70 hours service? of community yeah. service. Okay. 70 hours when I showed up to the Huntington Park to sign up. The guy couldn't believe how many hours I had because wow. back then I think 20, 30 was common. Well, so they probably counted all of the tags. Yeah. And they said, you're doing like, you did this much worth of damage yeah. at $7 an hour. Like you yeah, need to yeah. cover these many hours. Yeah. You know, I think that's how they figured it out. And so I showed up. I remember Benny, the guy from the yard house there, the, the HP yard. And he was like, whoa, bro, you got like 70 hours. <laughs> Overachiever here. <laughs> yeah. He's like, usually we only let folks come in five hours a day max. And we wow. only take like five people per day. Yeah. It's going to take you a while. It's going to take you a long time. And so, what were you doing in um, the community service? Community service? Uh, they put me in the graffiti crew. Oh, okay. So we so were out there cleaning up graffiti. and and That's funny. It, you know, they, they, they put me to clean up, but I, I what you know, the same thing that I was doing. So yeah, yeah. we ran around the neighborhoods and I kind of got to discover what, where the city of HP was. And even, even there's like a little sector that almost leads into Maywood that you think yeah. is Maywood, but it's like HP. Yeah. And then we were buffing out all the local gangs, you know? So I'm like, this, this is dangerous work, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, even um, to this day, people get shot for that. Yeah. Like the guys that come out, the cleanup crews, they get shot. For bluffing or buffing, it's called for buffing, buffing out. Yeah, yeah, tags, dude. That's in crazy. a way, it was cool because it showed me like it gave me skills, you yeah. know, paint painting skills, rollers. When you were young. I was young. When you learned like what an organized like job could be. I yeah, guess, right. Some some places, some walls were like um, concrete walls or brick walls, so we yeah. couldn't really paint over them, you know. So there was days where we. Go to the yard and pick up the sandblaster, you know, fill mm. up fill up the tank with water. Mm. Fun toys to play with, with sand. As a, as a and I'm like, kid, Shh, yeah. you know, they're cleaning. I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. Yeah. And they started letting me do eight hours a day for a few days so I can just like yeah, finish catch it. up, you know, catch up and finish. So um that that was my first experience into like art and getting in trouble. Well, that's still not doing any art still. I mean, I mean you're tagging, which is <laughs> <laughs> But but so how did how did you start like making actual artwork or did you start? No, that, you, that so do you give yourself the title of artist as well, right? You design stuff, right? Yeah, I, I don't think I give myself title of artist because I don't really paint. Yeah, I don't do charcoal. I don't do oil painting. I don't do so. Basically, you like design that. graphics. Some graphics, yeah. Basic but those stuff. graphics that you design, do you draw them, or do you? Some are drawn, and some are facilitated by some of my friends who are artists. Yeah. You know, okay, like yo, so, yeah. yo, guess I got this idea. Like, can you help me out? How much yeah. would it cost? My friend David Martinez came through a few years back, and he's like, yeah. yo, I'll donate some yeah. art. You know, some art for you, so you can kind of keep it moving. So you can be like a, you're like a project manager in a sense, and some of those things where you can hire other people to do other work, but you're like leading the. The crew. Yeah, I'm like a f facilitator, you know, I would yeah. say, because I, I, I'm really good with the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and I like, I like figuring out processes. Mm -hmm. So if I can figure out the process and plug people in and build yeah. something <clears throat> bigger than ourselves, that's kind of where, where I feel like my passion really lies, you know? Let, let me go back a little bit. Did you, after you finished or after high school, did you go right to college? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I thought I was never gonna make it to college, bro, because I was I was in my senior year of high school and I got called into the to the um to the office. Uh, what do they call it when uh, when they're trying to send you to college? A career counselor. Career, career. Yeah, I was going to the career college counselor center, yeah. to the college center, and when they found out, I was. I'm like, I don't know. I didn't go, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they found out I was an illegal immigrant or or undocumented, they straight out told me, bro, like, oh, you're not going to college. Yeah. It's too expensive. Like you can't afford it. Yeah. And they never called me back into the office, bro. Wow. Because that what that year was 2001, and so before 2001. There wasn't a way for undocumented folks to pay in-state tuition fees. Wow. So that didn't come. Uh, the law is called AB 540. Mm. Passed in 2000 and late 2001, early 2002. Mm. So what ended up happening was that when I graduated high school, I was actually able to enroll at ELAC. Mm. Because at that point when I enrolled, now you can go as an undocumented student and pay in-state tuition fees, which was a big difference because back then, uh, out-of-state fees like was true. about $150 a unit. Damn. In-state tuition <clears throat> fees was $11 a unit. <laughs> wow. So you can see like the big discrepancy there. You know, yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're yeah. documented, you're paying 11 bucks a unit, you're taking yeah. a class, that's $33. Well, basically, the state is paying for people that live in California to go to school, pretty much. And pretty if you're much. not from California, then you should pay. You had to more. fork it yeah. out. Yeah. So that, that year, I was lucky enough when I enrolled was that AB 540 passed. Yeah. So they let undocumented students sign up for the AB 540, and that allowed us to pay in-state tuition fees. That's cool. So that's kind of how I got started at ELA. Like yeah. in my first year after not thinking that I was going to be there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But I had a tough time at Elang, you yeah. know? Well, I was there from 2002 to 2008. That's, yeah, I mean, I don't know how it is now, but Elang was, you know, for me, it was like pretty much a fucking party school, you know? It was just like everybody's just hanging out. There's really out. no discipline. Yeah. I liked a lot of discipline there. Yeah. So what should have took me a year and a half, two years to Dude, complete? Forget it. Took me, took me six uh, I went to Elac so long in the theater department, so I was doing a lot of theater stuff that they 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 started calling me the ghost of the Elac theater. <laughs> like, that was a joke that was going on by the yeah, end. yeah. For me, I mean, for me, being first generation, yeah, me too. Yeah. In, in college, without no guidance, my exactly. parents didn't go to college. Like exactly. they they didn't know what they were just yeah. like go to college. Yeah, and I was going to class, but. Yeah. Halfway during the semester, I wasn't turning in my work, so I was failing, so I'd have to drop a few classes, you know? Yeah. So what I ended up starting with four classes, I would drop my classes, I ended up with one, you know? Yeah. And then the one that I had, maybe I failed it, you know? So I had to redo a I bunch would. of classes, mm. you know? So that that was my experience there, my, like, from 2002 to 2008. But you did it, bro, oh, yeah. you did it, and, and, and you went on to finish and get a bachelor's. Yeah. And donde? Uh, Cal State LA. So you went, you transferred to Cal State LA. Yeah. What ten, was your major? Ten years, ten years later. So that's, I finished ELAC 2008. I left school because uh, um, I didn't even apply for my AA at that time, yeah. even though I had finished. I came back 2012, talked to a counselor to see what I needed to kind of wrap that up. Mm. And they were hating on me, bro, because I showed up and they're like, whoa, you have like 110 units, mijo. Like, you're done. You're not trying to take any more classes here, right? <laughs> like, so they, they kind of forced me to apply for my AA there. Mm. But it had been already five years that I had left ELAC. So oh. the classes that I took didn't, count anymore. didn't really count anymore. But luckily, I took so many classes, bro, that I still qualified for a social and behavioral science degree. Wow. And we applied for a business degree, was, which was my major, you know, intended major. And mm. we, so we applied for two, but they said most likely you, you, you might only get the one. Mm. For sure you're going to get this one, but I don't think you're going to get the business. And sure enough, that's what happened. They gave me my AA in social sciences, and, but they didn't give me my business degree. That was 2013. Yeah. And come back around to maybe like 2017 after I had... I started the Cultivarte Studios 2012. Mm. So after doing that a few years, 2017, I was like, wow, I'm still missing some sort of skills. Yeah. Organization skills, like discipline yeah, yeah. skills. Like, yeah. okay, I can do artwork and I can figure things out, but I'm lacking something, you know? So 
So you, you're making frames at this time. That's when I first met you, right? Somebody yeah. told me um, to come and frame something with you, and we did, and I got to meet you, and I, I loved the little shack that you had right there. I mean, it was like a little it man. was packed though with like your work. Like you could tell this guy puts in work here. You had you had like all of your framing stuff. And then you had all of your silkscreen stuff. And then you had like another wall where you could have more stuff. It was just packed with things to do. And yeah, I had all my tools on the wall row and, and they would yeah. come down. When if I had to do something, this one would come down yeah. and the other one would go to the front. <laughs> and like I couldn't do two things at once, you know, if I couldn't yeah. frame and screen print. And then how I got into framing was after what I would say like 2008 after yeah. I left ELAC. I actually got a full-time job, and I was working at McDonald's while yeah. I was doing ELAC part-time. Mm -hmm. And 2008, one of my friends was like, yo, I'm, I'm working at this factory. Um, you know, they, they don't really require like a social, mm -hmm. and we're hiring full-time. We're looking for somebody full-time. You know, I think you'd be a great addition. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, I went and applied. They met me. They met another guy that my other buddy was... You know, they, they put two candidates mm. and they flipped the coin row at the end because they didn't know who to hire. <laughs> and they said I ended up winning. So they called me Holy back. Holy shit. And I ended up working in the sample department. So this, wow. this company in Vernon was selling to uh, Hobby Lobby, Home Goods, yeah. Kirkland's, Home Depot, JCPenney, uh, Walmart, Kmart, you know, all yeah. the big box stores. And I ended up working in the sample department. So we'd make a sample give it to the, to the seller. The seller would go to the meeting with the buyers. Mm. The buyer from, you know, Walmart would say, okay, we got this many stores. 10, we need 10,000 pieces of this one, 20,000 of this one. And then we'd make another sample because we were just the sample department. We'd make yeah. another sample and send the sample to China. <laughs> China would then produce the 10,000 and ship them back. Wow. So where I worked at, the, the, the warehouse was huge, but a lot of that, portion was mainly distribution yeah we were getting the pallet the guys were the, the guys at the dock were getting the pallets breaking them down building them back up and shipping them to the stores you know wow and and big company bro one probably yeah, the biggest yeah. in the nation as far as like commercial framing like that so i remember gemline do you know have you heard of gemline no mm, okay well gemline was another company that was here down the street but they also opened a bigger place in El Sereno and then a bigger place in Gardena. Um, that's the people that we used to use before, but they all moved out of Boyle Heights, and that's when I started using you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I thought maybe you had, had heard of them. What was the name of the company? Where I used to work at? Yeah. It's called uh, Crystal Art Gallery. Oh, okay. Crystal Art Gallery. That's a fucking massive business, dude. It's crazy. So from there, you were like, all right, I can do this smaller scale, me, myself, I yep. can make frames for people. I know yep. some artists. You started to get involved with the art community that way? That was, um, yeah, through the arts. Bro. I think my first uh, time getting involved in the community was through the Ovarian Cycles. Okay. A group of, of fam, uh, yeah. fam mujeres. 2012? 2012, 2013. When, when, it was the, when it was their big, um, what do you call it, anniversary or something? They did the big thing at... They, 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 they showed the movie. Yeah, they showed a documentary and oh, a movie, one, yeah. I think, around that time. And so I started getting involved with them. That was, a, that was way later than 2012 then. I think that was like 2014, 2015, okay. something like that. Um, so I've been, I, we went through like two or three La Conchas spaces yeah, 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 in those, yeah. through those years. So that was my first time really doing work in the community room. Mm. I just kind of became addicted yeah. to, to a certain extent of... of giving back or putting in work yeah. you know that was my first time coming from southeast la first generation to coming out here to east la boyle heights where there's third fourth generation folks organizing yeah the family was organizers their mom you know their parents yeah. siblings whatnot been organizing for years through the chicano more moratorium and yeah. movements like that you know we we never had that in southeast la so when i came out here i was like wow like it's different yeah. out here yeah. And so I got involved with them and that was the first group of folks that, you know, we were working with for a long time, showed them um, how to screen print, mm. built them a dark room in one of their places and That's crazy. Uh, donated equipment through the years, yeah. you know, just just working in community. So that was my first time, I would say, getting involved 
with the arts, you know, <laughs> through first through framing. And then I always had the interest of making shirts. So in, I think in 2013, I made my first shirt, my fe- first shirt, set of shirts. So I'm trying to understand like your business then. So your business is making shirts and you sell shirts and you, but you also give a lot back. You also do a lot of free like printing and distribution for, um, como se dice, like for, for pro- at protests and stuff like that. Like you show up, you pull up, you print stuff, you print posters for people, you give them out for yeah. free. But yeah. as, as a business, you also like do pop ups and you sell silk screen shirts and shirts that you've made yourself and, and your crew has made and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Right? So I think first through the years was making frames. Yeah. First was buying and selling frames. And then later, after I acquired some few tools and some few machinery specialized for that, yeah. I started making my own frames. Mm. Uh, I ended up working at Michael's Arts and Crafts for a couple of years, I think like 2014, 2016. Yeah. So I learned a little bit more about the high-end side of making frames because all I used to know was production yeah. in China, cheap stuff. You know, yeah, you yeah. go buy a frame at Kmart for five bucks, 10 bucks. Yeah. Um, but through the years, just being involved in the community, I always felt like I had to stay involved and that was my best way to do it was to kind of like take orders try to pay the rent but somehow still be involved you know yeah like because there's it's a different reward um there's the reward of of course the check you know the money in the pocket and being able to pay your bills is good yeah but that other reward of participating and being a part of something and giving back is a whole another like thing that you feel that fulfills you as well it's it's very fulfilling and it's very hard work yeah. you know because you always hear about the uh, uh, folks who organize and protest and and help the community out you you end up wearing yourself down sometimes, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. You put the community first and, and before you, and then at one point it catches up to you where like, man, I'm, I'm, donating, I'm donating over here, but I'm backed up three months of rent at the studio. <laughs> like, so that's some of the stories that folks don't know that I yeah. don't really tell to folks or it's behind the scenes, you know? Yeah, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm out here doing work, yeah. donating my time, but I'm backed up three months of rent yeah. at the studio. Like, I, I, you know? Yeah. I remember showing up one time to hope to go uh, help my friend uh, Mariela Saba, a good friend of mine, um, paper mache, and we showed up with just enough gas to get there, man. <laughs> no money in my pocket, and we took a few shirts of I think our design. We already had a few shirts at that time, and I had to ask folks there at the at the meeting. Uh, when they passed the mic around, I was when I introduced myself or whatnot. You know, I was like, "Yo, like you know what? We're out here. We're down to help, but we like, need some gas money. We need some gas money <laughs> yeah. to get back. Like we, nope. you know. So we brought a few shirts. If you would like to buy one, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll gladly take a donation. So I think yeah. we raised like they raised like fifty bucks for us. You know, at that time it was like, well, cool. Like wow, you know, we get to go home. Yeah. <laughs> literally you know pump some gas in the car and go home so that's awesome that's a it takes a village kind of a story you know Mm -hmm. like it's it's everybody pitches in a little bit that's crazy dude so don't forget to donate click below (laughs) (laughs) visit the website (laughs) there you go uh and yeah so after being involved in the framing i uh, at some point at the studio i was like you know what i should be making my own shirts yeah i always wanted to make shirts that was really like where my artist interest really was, you know, because framing was just like this job and the skill that I learned. Yeah. But my passion was to produce clothing or something, yeah, you know? Yeah. So that's when I uh, started. Your sense of humor too, that like you get to display your sense of humor in your design. So it's kind of like, that's kind of like where your show is a little bit too, right? Yeah, I, I, I think when we design, you really get to see my personality yeah. in, in the clothing, you know? And, and you really get to feel our story because cultivarte, even the word, like Spanish, English, yeah. mixed word, three words in one, cultivando, cultura, y arte, you know, cultivarte. Yeah. So that alone kind of pushes my artwork to a certain way, yeah. certain road down the way, you know, immigrant rights, protesting, uh, artists, just being an artist, being a first generation Mexicano here yeah. in the States. And just so a lot of my clothing sometimes is in Spanish. Yeah. You know, so we kind of do really take on that for the business. You know, really my my personality and my story is just being portrayed through my shirts, yeah. you know. 
um, just kind of sharing the story. And when folks wear our shirts, it kind of tells their story too. You know, you, you find like-minded individuals yeah, exactly. who've been through the same struggle and they're like, man, I really connect yeah. with that right there. Like, <laughs> the molcajete. The molcajete always grinding. Always grinding. Like, yeah, I love that one. I was working so much, bro. I was like, my friend David Martinez, uh, artist friend of mine, had just came back from Berkeley and he was like, yo, bro, let me help you out. Like, I'll come, let me come around the shop, learn a little bit and I'll help you with some art and you know, help me with some screen printing. And I'm like, cool, you know, yeah. let's do it. So I shot him that idea. I was like, yo, David, we need a molcajete fool that says always grinding, you know? Yeah. And he just took it, ran with it, came back with a little sketch. Boom. I scanned it in into perfect. the computer, printed out a film. We made some shirts and that's over the years, one of our funniest <laughs> bestsellers that... Folks see it and they're like, "Yeah, man, like that's me, you know, that, re, that re, I can relate to that. And it, it, just like the name of your company, it has like a lot of layers. It has the comedy, it has the, the history, it has, you know, the community, it has only certain people understand it, you yeah. know, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So after all this, you still like finished your bachelor's degree at, at Cal State LA. Yeah. I remember, yeah, how you were like, uh, oh, yeah, I'm still going to classes. I was like, oh, this guy's still going to school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That and, was and crazy to me when I heard that. 2017, I decided to apply for business school at Cal State LA. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, because I felt primarily I always owed that to my mom. Yeah. She was always pushing for, like, education, education, yeah, yeah, education, yeah. go to school. And at that point, my brother, immigrant folks as well, managed to graduate from UCLA room. Wow. Younger than me. So he yeah. graduated before me, you know, and yeah. I was like, oh, damn. damn, this yeah. will beat me, you know, <laughs> like I can't, I can't stay yeah. behind, you know, like yeah, I, yeah. I, I owe this to my mom. Like he got one, like I should go, I need to go and finish, you know? Mm. And then when uh, I was at the studio, just doing things and I felt I was missing something, I thought that maybe that would be a good tool yeah, for me, course, you know, to yeah. go back to school and Especially go back to business school. You did it in business. So that was like even more like down your alley that you needed, yeah. Yeah, I felt I needed some organization, some discipline, some What do you think is knowledge. the best thing that you took from that business degree? Like, what do you think is the thing that you carry with you the most? I think just the confidence, bro. Yeah. Primarily. Well, let's just say that having the, the whole thing of having a winning attitude, like, you know, it works. Show up like a winner, you're going to act like a winner, you're probably going to win, you know, or you're going to, you know, you're, you're not going to be afraid, you're, gonna, you're not going to be timid. And so I totally, yeah, I totally see that. Like just knowing now that you have a, you have a, 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 I guess an archive of like tools to use, things that you learn, gives you that confidence to just like walk into something and be like, all right, I can handle this situation, let's manage it like this. Yeah. Uh, um, and then once you go to school, bro, like being undocumented and not really ever being dedicated to school. Yeah. You go into the classroom competing with these other folks in the classroom mm. and you realize like, wow, I do really have the skills yeah. to not only keep up, but to lead yeah. in, in this classroom, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you, you go from thinking like you don't belong to showing up and once you show up, you realize like, man, like yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a lot better than some of these other students. Yeah. And so that kind of gives you that 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 confidence that's needed to say like, man, I can walk into any spot, yeah, and really, you know, yeah. take on the work or take on the responsibility. Yeah. And I felt too when I went back to school, I was taking a lot of classes, five classes per semester full time, mm -hmm. while still working at the studio, doing my studio, and um, that kind of showed me. It kind of put it in my brain to say, like, man, I'm going to school, doing these five classes, still trying to manage the shop and make frames. Mm. I'm doing all these things. Like, what was I doing before? You know. Uh, so they yeah. push you to the. They push you to your <laughs> limit. You know, you're gonna go there and you're gonna get pushed to the limit. Mm. Because yeah, if you, you don't if know how much you can do until you're. Faced with it. It was like going to boot camp, you know. I, yeah. I can almost picture, i never been to the armed forces, but I can feel something, you know, they throw yeah. you in there and throw you in the fire and, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you learn to survive, you learn to swim, and then before you know it, you're you're leading the pack, you know, and yeah, it's yeah. like, whoa, like, uh, one of my favorite teachers, Dr. Horton, 
I walked into business class one time. This was a business writing class, one of my first classes at Cal State mm. LA, which I was super grateful because after that class, I had to write so many reports. Mm. So it was good to take that class and learn how to write reports, a 30-page mm. report, and then go to these other classes and just replicate the work, you know? Mm. And I walked in with one of my shirts one day, and she's like, whoa, Ray. She goes, that's cold. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't get it. You know, like, cold? Like, what do you mean, Dr. Harden? And she's like... That's fire, you know, yeah. that, that's like, that's really <laughs> that's nice. Good, yeah. Like, I like what you're doing. Like, tell me more about it, you know? So she really became interested in my story. Mm. I shared my immigrant story with her, just things like that. Mm. And she became my mentor. Man. Nice. So when we were, it was a Saturday class, so it was long. It was like a four hour class. So when we had a break, I would take my lunch. She would take her lunch. I was sitting in the front and we were just chopping it up. We were just talking about ideas. She was giving me ideas. She was my almost I can say my consultant. Yeah. At for, that point, for you know, free, yeah, for free, man. Because then I asked her one day, my final one of my final days, I, I we talked for like about two hours, bro, just yeah. about. And I was writing things down, and she was giving me pointers and direction and mm -hmm. things like that, and. I ended up asking her, like, Dr. Hornin, how much do I owe you? Because, you know, <laughs> she's like, oh, honey, I, I charge about $5,000 an hour to go and speak for a company. Yeah. But if they want a full in-depth report, then it's about fifteen. dollars Yeah. I was like, damn, I owe her. I owe you a lot. And she's like, <laughs> and, you know, that's when she told me something that I've heard before. It was like, you don't owe me anything. Yeah. Like, pay it forward. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's that's cool, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. So that, that was... Super uh, exciting to hear from her, and I can I see her doing conferences and doing things on her yeah. Instagram and being involved and leading the the technology sector of education and workforce yeah. environment kind of combined, you know. And I was like, wow, like she's saying that I got it, you know, like yeah. I got it, like wow, like so that was one of my 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 biggest uh, tools that I acquired there, just that mm. that you know hearing that. From somebody else, you know, and getting that push in in the education and school that I never really had before, you know. That's crazy, dude. She sounds amazing too. Amazing, Dr. Uh, Terry uh, Harden. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I think I could look her up. I'm gonna Google you, Miss Harden. So, you are now. I want to get into like you're opening a center now. We've been involved in the community. I just, uh, just to be clear, like I just yeah. barely saw a post on it, so yeah. I don't really know what's going on with this yet. Um, but. Not not personally me opening up a center, but in the community as artists, as organizers, we've been working with these folks who are trying to build this center mm. in Southeast LA. So that started in about, I know that movement started in 2013 through them. Uh, I think we ended up tagging along in about 2016. Always tagging. Attending, always, always tagging. tagging. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this group? Um, this was the first time I was involved. This group was being led by uh, Anthony Rendon. Mm -hmm. Anthony Rendon, who is uh, now the current uh, California Assembly Speaker. Okay. So he's a 60, 62nd district, which is encompasses our neighborhoods, Paramount, mm. Bell, Maywood, Cala, Cala. Sela. So yeah. just the Sela area. Yeah, yeah. And uh, his story is that he used to work for, I believe it was uh, a, 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 an education, I think it's Maldef, yeah. or, or one of those education uh, nonprofits. Yeah. And he decided to, he, he thought that there was a need in the community for a leader that came from the community. So mm. he went, he got into politics. And so he became assembly speaker of the district. Okay. And then he ended up being, becoming assembly speaker of California. Okay. So that was like yeah, a, a huge for our community to have somebody in power that really advocates for the people yeah. in the community, you know? So we got invited to these meetings. My friend Liz Alcantar, Cudahy, council member in the city of Cudahy. Mm. Uh, back before that, she was an artist, organizer there in the neighborhood. She called us up and said, yo, Ray, like, there's these meetings going down. I think you should be in these meetings. Mm. So we ended up showing up to these meetings, you know, as artists and really sticking with it. And from mm. those meetings came the Sela Art Festival. Mm. So that's this for the folks that don't know. The Sela Arts Festival is the festival that gets that's held 
down in the river bed. In the river, yeah. In the river bed, bro. You guys did a really good. I didn't go to it this year, but I, I did see all of your social media was like, um, I mean, it was lit. It was fucking like perfect. Like you guys did a really good job of promoting that. So, so yeah, after, you know, after a few years of, of being involved, you kind of learn what it takes and, and the things you got to do that are necessary to make mm. this happen. So um, the idea of this festival was to showcase the artists in the community mm. and the need for a space in the community. Yeah. So that was the idea of that Anthony Rendon had his vision to kind of give us the lead and say, like, Yo, yeah. you as artists in this festival... What do you want to do? Yeah. If we gave you money, what do you want to do there at the yeah. festival? So they became proposals, man. We learned how to write proposals. Yeah. Because then, well, you know, I want to do this. Okay, put it in writing. Mm -hmm. Give me a budget. List me your materials. And then we turn that in. And they would say uh, between the board of advisors, some of them including artists, bro. So they took artists mm -hmm. were on the board to pick and choose what projects made it, mm -hmm. and well, most of the projects were approved. That was the cool thing, that they were really looking wow. for artists to empower th empower themselves, them, yeah. empower themselves and, and give them the money that they needed to do the project that they wanted to do and showcase their art at the festival. So that was really important because I don't feel like we've ever had anything like that. I've never experienced anything like that where people say, come to this meeting, yeah. we want you to do your art, what do you want to do? Yeah, clean slate. You know, it's like man, what <laughs> That's makes awesome. you think? Even as an artist, like, yeah. what do I really want to do? You know, because the fact is that there's a ton of money out there, and these uh, bigger organizations, these bigger foundations that have money, have money to give, but you do have to have that ability to, yeah, make our our re um, to make the proposals to to budget things to show them exactly like how it's going to get spent so that it's not just saying hey give us 10,000 bucks it's like no we need $10,000 right. but this is where you know this is where it's all going and it's it's to benefit whatever these groups of people and these artists will be you know getting work out it's just there's so much money out there that that yeah you need to show up at these meetings and and Show them what you need too. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. That's crazy. Yeah, so that that was the beginning of what is now going to be the Sela Cultural Center. Mm. So through these through these arts festivals, we got to showcase to the state that there is culture down here in yeah. Southeast LA. Yeah. That there is uh the need for artist space that we don't have yeah. something like that. You know, yeah. you go to the west side and you got museums, you got the oh, LA yeah. Phil, you got all kinds of organizations, bro, that are art. Yeah. Even here in Boyle Heights, because when I came to Boyle Heights, yeah. it's so different out here, you know? So during <laughs> doing like data research, we found out that Boyle Heights has about, maybe a few years back was like 1,300 registered nonprofits. Wow. A lot of them are arts-based, community-based. In Sela, we had about 300 registered nonprofits and wow. about two thirds of those were churches. Wow. <laughs> so really not really a lot of arts, yeah. you know, more like, you know, Los Hermanos have their place and folks yeah. come in and, and worship and do Religious. their thing and, yeah. you know, in community, which is still like an organizing space in the community, but they don't really focus in the arts, you know, yeah. there's really not of arts, a lot of arts organizations. So once we got to showcase that one year, two years. Wow. Um, the vision started coming together from them because I don't think they gave us the vision in the beginning to say seven years from now, 10 years from now, we're trying to build a cultural center. Mm. We just knew there was the arts festival. Mm. And then through the years, it kind of developed and snowballed into this bigger thing mm. that then one year they came and said, we're, we're actually making a foundation mm. to get money to build this center that we want to build for you guys. It's awesome. And so... That's when those other meetings started. They brought in uh, Frank Gehry, mm. famous architect wow. yeah. from the Disney Hall, and yeah. he's got a lot of projects worldwide, uh, dude, bro. He's, he's the biggest. I think he's known for a lot of his architects like in the world. Basic using basic materials to create these extravagant looking buildings and yeah. things like that. So they brought him into the project to lead the the design. Wow, dude! So we got Frank Gehry on uh, on the team, bro. Wow. I've, I've met the guy. Yeah. Uh, all his his assistants, the the this guy Ten Tensho, yeah. uh, amazing individual. They came to a meeting and they said, "Okay, you guys are the artists. We're building this center for you guys. Yeah. What do you want to see?" So, who's 
whose building is it going to be then? Is it? Well, now we were just, like you said, you just saw the post a few days ago. Yeah. We were at the uh, meeting with the folks from the city, the supervisors mm. board meeting, mm. um, because the, the, the foundation wants this building to be owned by the city. Okay. Uh, LA County. Yeah. Because uh, to maintain something like this over the years, it costs millions a year yeah, to course. keep the buildings up and, you know, do, 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 do just keep it nice and yeah, running the and the lights and the bills and, yeah. you know, so who's going to... don't know how much that is. It's a lot. It, it's a lot of money. And then this complex, is, it's a big complex, bro. There's like Damn. buildings. Yeah. You know? It's a campus. Um, if everything goes through, it's a, it's a campus, exactly. Mm. It's going to be like Main Street in the middle and buildings on both sides. So these buildings wow, can come dude. out to the to the main street and showcase their art when there's events, you know? Wow. Uh, there's going to be a 500-seat amphitheater wow. that we are trying to get the L.A. Phil, yeah. the L.A. Philharmonic, to bring the organization down to Sela yeah. and run this space. Yeah, they have the um, youth. They have the youth orchestra that would be. They awesome. have the Yo, yeah, Yola, yeah. Yolo, Yola, one of, Yola. One of those, yeah. Uh, youth yeah, orchestra Yola of Los of Angeles. Angeles yeah. uh, out in Inglewood. So yeah. we're trying to get something like that similar yeah, out in Southeast LA, like a small branch of that, that's you know? Awesome, um, dude. I was just on a panel. I dude, got that's invited. That's huge. <laughs> it's, it's huge, man. It's yeah. huge. I mean, and Sela deserves it because um, for so many years, um, like we all love, like, Living out here in Ball Heights in East LA, like I've always been like, oh, I love Maywood. Oh, I love HB. I love, like, they're so, like, quote unquote, Mexican out there. You know, all the gorudos are always out there. Yeah. Like, I would go to the the paisa bars out there. You know, it's always <laughs> like, we always look, I always looked at it like like that one primo from Mexico, you know? We're and, known for potreros, parral, yeah. lidos. <laughs> exactly. You know, el farallon, like all the paisa exactly. clubs out in, in, in Sela, you know? And yeah, I mean, it's it's like where you go to get, you know, your more and more Mexican stuff. Oh, dude, it's crazy. But um, oh God, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, yeah. So, but it's awesome that you guys are getting this, like this giant thing to sit out there, which is going to make you central. Because seriously, after seeing what you guys did with that last festival out there in the river, and I was looking at clips, and I was like, wow, these guys put something together. This is not just, hey, everybody bring a tent and a table and it's a pop-up. This was an organized, like, um, you know, event, an organized, like, parade of art so much beautiful stuff was happening on there you had your clips you had some funny shit too but you also had like so many like different features of different people it was it was just beautiful you guys did a magnificent job at that so like and but what i also see is like you also said look we exist too like exist. look at all these motherfuckers out here like you brought out so many artists to represent that that it was it's undeniable now so like the fact that you guys are getting the center like this is like just like next level so fuck congratulations this, i hope this, all that goes through and and yeah keep us posted on yeah this is gonna be a world-class spot bro. yeah this is a yeah. world class yeah definitely uh, yeah space that that we're building down there you know it's, it's gonna be so many things I, I don't know if i ever seen it's almost like a campus like yeah, an art campus of yeah. different disciplines videography photography that's crazy um, dude. a museum there's a museum yeah. coming down there there's and there's, it's not a school it's not a school yeah no but we also ask for maker space a lot of maker space because a lot of us don't have places to produce yeah. our art, to make our art, to make our films, to, yeah, or to you know, do our photography, to, to, you know, showcase our art in a museum. We don't have a museum. Bro. Yeah. We got to come all the way across town yeah, 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 to, yeah. to, you know, see some nice art. Yeah. And so to, to bring that to Sela. That's amazing, dude. That's amazing. Like, you know? Yeah. And, and I kind of, it, it's weird to say, but, you know, I know we're going to bring in folks into the community yeah. So it's always tough navigating that gentrification line, you know, like, yeah, well, what is yeah, this yeah. building? Who is it going to attract? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's coming to, who's this going to serve? Mm. You know, but I feel like the best way is being involved. We've been able to have that voice bro, yeah. to, to actually make that ours, you know, make that really be of the communities, yeah. by the community, for the community, you know, so, yeah. because if not, we're not involved, we're going to get steamrolled. Keep Somebody else is going to come and, and do whatever they want to do and not include us, you know, but us being part of this process, I feel like this is for us. Yeah. 
this is by us for us you know yeah, so I mean, it sounds like it sounds to me like it's all you know going down the right path it's all it sounds to me like it's legit it sounds to me like it's something that like i would love to have over here too you know if i was only 20 years old again <laughs> and i'm like you know go through that and find a place like that uh it's amazing i i yeah i i I'm just excited for it, like, the more that I know now. Like, so, so excited for all that. Yeah, we're hoping that this gets built in the next few years. Yeah. They've raised already $124 million out of the projected $170 that it's going to cost. Wow. So, Do you know the location? Yeah, it's going to be uh, right off the river, just kind of where, where the Cellar Arts Festival happens mm -hmm. in the bottom. But this is going to be on top. Okay. Um, the cool thing about this land is that right now it's a public works Okay. Folks, so they take care of the river. They got the, the trucks and all of that, you know, to service the river and keep yeah, it going. Yeah, yeah. So they're going to donate the land, bro. Wow. To make this happen um, so that nobody really gets displaced yeah. in a sense, you know, like we're right. not taking over these apartments or not destroying these old buildings. Yeah. We're going to take a spot, a place that the city owns, mm. the public yards, uh, and then we're going to. Move, they're going to move that somewhere else, wow. and then they're going to build the center there. Wow. wow. That's amazing, dude. Congrats on that, and I hope that uh, you stay involved with that and, and keep your keep your heart in your community in it, you know? I'm trying to run the museum, bro, so. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we're definitely um, at the end of this um, And I always ask the guest if there's anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about. Maybe just like just telling folks to just, you know, stay involved. Yeah. I feel like that's been a lesson over the years for me. Like we know things always happen, but yet we're never showing up to city council meetings. Yeah. Once a month, we can't show up for a community. And so when these things happen right in front of our eyes, We think they're happening behind our backs, but it's because we're not involved and we're not showing up, you know? So through the years, I feel like I've learned- a little bit of both. A little bit of both. <laughs> sometimes because, you know, sometimes they, they, they move back. the meetings around yeah. and they hide stuff. And I, I, I grew up in HP and Bell, yeah. so Bell, we had Rizzo, the, 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 the yeah. mayor a few years back, 2013, who yeah. was stealing money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got a $70 million dollar loan, took it out on the credit of the city. Yeah. They raised the taxes. Uh, so down in Bell, if you live in Bell, anywhere else, you're paying like your phone tax. Mm. You know, you get your phone bill from the company, AT&T, whatever. And anywhere else, it's about 2% your tax. Mm. But in Bell, we pay 10% mm. tax. We pay a 10% water tax. Wow. We pay higher, higher uh, property taxes. All to pay back these loans that, the, that these crooked mayors and council members in the day Wow. Uh, kind of put on us, on you know, yeah. leverage our future for their benefits, you know? You know, what, we, what I've seen down in, in, in Southeast LA, uh, because I, I'm not involved in any other cities as much, yeah. you know, that's my hometown, that's where I grew up, that's kind of where my heart is, uh, is that over the years since that incident happened with the mayors, that you see a lot of younger folks younger generation, second generation, first generation folks who actually managed to go to college in mm. our neighborhoods, come back and actually take these positions. Mm. Like we have a lot of council members down in our neighborhoods who are from the community, awesome, yeah. who we actually recognize as members of the community who have mm. put in work in the community. And to see these folks in those positions, um, you can see, really see some of the change that's starting to happen down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. The, the unity between, you know, making things happen oh. and being involved in the city and being an artist and staying that whole, organized. The whole thing with the mayor was a big wake-up call for that side that of town. Was a big, <laughs> that was a big wake-up call. Yeah. And I think a lot of folks who are, into, who are in the politics now kind of saw that as, as a way to... You know, take you know, say like you know what we we belong in these rooms. Yeah. Like we should be making the decisions. Yeah. We we should be having a voice yeah. in, in in what's going on in the city in our neighborhoods. So I feel that's been a big part of this movement through the years. Is yeah. now we see folks who are involved that we know, yeah. that we recognize, that we organize with, that we you know, yeah. ran around with as as kids. You know, it's like yeah. oh well, that's 
so and so from Bell High School. He went to Bell High School. He and then he went to college and yeah, then he came yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh shit, he came back. You know, because a lot of the times <laughs> we say like, oh, we want to make it out the neighborhood. Yeah. Right. We want to make it out the hood, but like, why can't we make it in the hood? The best thing I ever heard uh, uh, somebody say once is, "Don't move, improve." Don't move. That's a yeah. good one. Yeah. yeah. So with that, we are definitely at the end of this, and um. There is a question that we ask everybody at the end of each podcast, and it's a very vague question. You can answer any way you want, um, but I only ask that you try to answer in one sentence. So if a being from another planet um, presented itself in front of you and was able to sense everything that you've been through in life, they were able to understand like your struggles of coming to this country and why you came to this country and those feelings that you felt... And what you felt when you were um, caught and and uh, writing on walls and stuff, and and what you went through and how it changed your mind, and what you know what your mom felt and what you understood, and as you went through life and the struggles of finishing your school and all this, and they were able to grasp everything, and they were just like wow, and they asked you, they said, Ray Sepulveda, how do you do it? I think it's just a, a, a story of perseverance, bro. When you come from the places we come from and you've dealt with the the, the lifestyle and everything that you know that there's always something better. There could be something better. You know, we're always fighting for something better, bro. So yeah. I will tell folks, like, never stop fighting for what you want. Never stop fighting for your dreams, you know? So let's say keep that. It, keep it moving, you know? Never stop fighting for your dreams. Thank you, bro. We appreciate your time. And we appreciate all the work that you do. And we'll see you guys next week.